Good morning and welcome to our event, Vision and Visibility, Scaling Transparency. Delighted to see so many of you joining us today here in Milano at this uh, amazing location, Triennale di Milano, and connected online. We have many connecting uh, with us online. Vision and visibility, scaling transparency. Vision is about the garment and footwear industry we want at a time when change has never been more urgent. Visibility is about the transparency and traceability needed to shed light along the whole value chain on impacts for people and the planet. The garment and footwear industry is an important industry for the global north and for the global south, worth about 3 trillion US dollars annually the GDP of France, is at the intersection of the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations. Now, we know the what, what needs to be done for this global industry to become more circular, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. We know the how, rules, regulation, standards, innovative solutions are more and more out there. We now need to make it happen at scale, since without scale, we'll not solve the sustainability challenges at stake. And now I'm very pleased to open uh, our first uh, session with the institutional remarks and welcome on stage Tatiana Molchean, our Executive Secretary uh, of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you, Tatiana, for joining. Welcome. And I'm very pleased to welcome on stage um, Carlo Capaza, the Chairman of Camera Nazionale della Moda Italiana. Carlo, thank you for joining. We'll start with welcome remarks from Tatiana Molcean. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Is it working? Yes, it does. Uh, very warm good morning to everyone. I'm really, really pleased to be today here together with you, and I would like to extend appreciation for your interest in today's event. Uh, but, of course, I would like to, uh, to uh, also uh, greet uh, uh, my co-panelist or co-opening, uh, Mr. Kapasa, for his presence. It's good to see also colleagues from Uzbekistan and, uh, of course, for our partners, for, uh, Mr. Paolo Naldini, director of the Fondazione Pistoleta Città dell'Arte, our co-organizing partner, but also for those who have offered us this amazing venue here at Triennale Milano, the president, Mr. Boeri, for hosting and having us here. Today's discussions are very important. Uh, we see all the impact that um, the clothing sector can have on the sustainability. And it affects, when we speak about sustainability, it's not only the climate, the environment, it's also the social aspect and human rights aspect that are also involved. But it's not only about the challenges and the negative impact. I strongly believe, and I think we all at UNIC strongly believe that uh, this is also a sector that has a huge potential to make a change in when it comes to sustainability. This past few weeks, and I would say that I've been seeing the, the data for not only this week, but for the this year and the last year, we have seen <coughs> extreme weather conditions. And of course, this is a result of our common activity. And we really need to scale up our efforts, including in this sector. In one of the recent reports that we have seen for 20, for, was, it was for this year report that um, the McKinsey report from this year, 
it shows us that by 2030, uh, extreme weather events could jeopardize $65 billion worth of apparel exports and eliminate nearly 1 million jobs in economies that are among the most central to the global clothing sector. I think this is impressive data to be taken in consideration. And we are talking about the impact of extreme weather conditions. So please bear that in mind. Uh, this is why when we talk how we can change this, how we can really change. One of the key solutions is, of course, um, and what we are going to talk extensively about is about the making supply chains more sustainable and also more resilient. The industry has really a key role when it comes to addressing the um, and ensuring the global engagements in this sector. You might have heard already many times about our common goal to decrease or to limit the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And it doesn't really seem that we are on the track yet. It seems that we need to do more. On the regulatory side, a wave of legislation is aimed at ensuring that the textile and clothing sector is making a tangible contribution to this objective. In the EU, there are at least 16 pieces of legislation that uh, are relating to the clothing and textile uh, under examination, or in 2023, this is what we saw this uh, being in discussions. And of course, once this piece of legislation would be put in practice or in application, it will change uh, the, uh, some of the patterns. The, it will require businesses to have a fully supply chain visibility across all tiers of productions. And this wave of legislation is really turning the industry into a highly regulated sector. And we know that this wave of regulation is not uncontroversial. Many are voicing challenges about the costs, about the administrative burden this might entail. And indeed, many companies have limited visibility over their suppliers. They lack reliable and standardized data to make meaningful decisions for our joint journey towards a low carbon textile industry and for their compliance with the many new regulatory requirements. This is why the supply chain traceability and transparency are so important. And at UNC, we are working to harness this. The digital and green transformation are topics which come as a priority for our member states. Circular economy models offer significant opportunities for delivering improved sustainability and meeting international commitments towards a low carbon economy. And I'm really, really proud that as uh, Executive Secretary of the UNIC, uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, to say that our 56 member states have taken a leading role in this area, seizing the opportunity, and they did so at our highest level during the 69th Commission in 2021, and they endorsed again this commitment in 2023. Today's event, uh, Vision and Visibility, Scaling Transparency, marks a milestone for our Sustainability Pledge initiative. It is the culmination of several years of research, development, work, capacity building, and outreach activities. We have already in 2021 developed a series of policy recommendation, implementation guidelines, and information exchange standards. And they have been endorsed by all members of UNIC. And this toolbox comes as part of the Sustainability Pledge Initiative together that we are implementing uh, UNIC and the International Trade Center with the support from the European Union, uh, which is one of the major support and donor for this uh, endeavor. Uh, and in particular, the Directorate uh, General for International Partnerships of the European Commission has been a, a partner for us in, in, uh, in this process. Looking ahead about scaling up, it's a top priority. We have been discussing about scaling up, about the importance with, with, uh, with uh, colleagues that um, we need to scale up our efforts. Uh, single individual cases are not enough to make a real change for the sector. 
This is why at the UN Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, which is hosted by UNIC, we have started to work on a UN transparency protocol, supporting due diligence across sectors and different regions. And these efforts, it's a multi-stakeholder platform, and today's event is a testimony of its convening power. Part of our sustainability pledge, our call to action, has been joined by academia, civil society, international organization, producers, manufacturers, um, brands by medium and small enterprises, but also large brands from Europe, America, Africa, Asia, Asia and Oceania. It covers the whole ecosystem of the clothing sector. Today is the launch of the community of practice, a community of actors joining us here in Milan and online that have all pledged for traceability and transparency. And in less than three years, the sustainability pledge received more than 100 pledges involving more than 100 or 800 partners. We are proud of these figures and achievements and uh, this wouldn't have been possible without you all uh, here today. So, today is an opportunity yet to explore, to scale up, to advance our discussions, to make this effort really one that can bring a change for our common uh, planet that we live on. And once again, I thank you all for your enthusiasm, for your support, and for your commitment. And I'm looking really forward to the discussions that we'll have later today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tatiana for being with us today and for sharing about uh, the UNEC Sustainability Pledge Initiative, progress so far and what is next. Now, the Minister of Environment and Energy Security of Italy, who cannot be with us today due to institutional commitments in Rome, kindly sent us a video message which I'm asking to project. Thank you. Buongiorno a tutti, mi dispiace non essere presente di persona oggi a Milano e ringrazio sinceramente Unece, ringrazio la Fondazione Pistoletto per l'invito che mi fa molto piacere, ritengo importante fornire un contributo all'evento di oggi che affronta temi rilevanti quali la trasparenza e la sostenibilità eh, nei settori dell'abbigliamento e delle calzature. Si tratta di, di due comparti che dimostrano con sempre maggiore convinzione quanto sia ormai irrinunciabile per noi l'attenzione al, al percorso dei processi produttivi sostenibili. E in tale contesto quindi è essenziale poter fornire alle aziende tutti gli strumenti, le linee guida, raccomandazioni per, per certificare anche i processi e la sostenibilità della loro produzione, che è la garanzia. Davanti alle richieste che arrivano dai consumatori, le imprese devono poter disporre di metodologie che, che diano quindi le garanzie e le certezze sulle provenienze e su tutte le lavorazioni. Sono 100 miliardi di pezzi all'anno nel mondo. Credo sia molto positivo quindi l'impegno per la sostenibilità sviluppato da imprese, istituzioni e università che oggi con voi illustrano i progressi e le, e le nuove potenzialità. Anche in questo campo quindi è importante ed essenziale il contributo delle, delle nuove tecnologie che sempre più spesso si intrecciano con, con le pratiche per la, la, la sostenibilità, il termine sostenibilità forse è abusato ma è, è quello che rende idea, va certamente in questa direzione l'applicazione della tecnologia di blockchain che promette di avere ripercussioni e applicazioni molto positive ed è importante lo sviluppo di tutte quelle che possono definirsi le buone pratiche per un utilizzo sempre, sempre più diffuso eh, delle, delle novità tecnologiche e digitali utile a certificare tutto il percorso di tracciabilità delle produzioni una battaglia storica del, del settore fashion anche il Ministero dell'Ambiente e della Sicurezza Energetica intende fare la propria parte per sostenere questi, questi processi per stimolare questa sensibilità, processi che puntano a diffondere la trasparenza. Il nostro impegno è analogo 
al vostro per contribuire tutti a costruire un sistema produttivo sempre più moderno, sempre più attento all'ambiente e proiettato quindi verso le nuove economie, le economie del futuro. E questa è la sfida comune che noi abbiamo e con questo auguro a tutti voi buon lavoro. Many thanks to Minister Picato Fratin for his welcome message and for sharing about the commitment uh, of the Ministry of Environment and Energy Security of Italy to support the industry in its journey for uh, transparency, sustainability and circularity. And now, Connected with us online is the representative of the European Commission, our partner and donor for this initiative. So I'm very pleased to have you with us, Karsten Sorensen from the Trade Investment, Climate Entrepreneurship and Value Chains, a Directorate General for International Partnerships, um, Carson, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, because um, as Tatiana said earlier, uh, indeed, we have been partners from the outset in this initiative, and uh, we have been working very, very closely with our colleagues and friends from the UNEC. And um, it's... Um, it's uh, a topic um, which is not just one of many we are we are dealing with. It's um, a topic which is really, really close to our heart. Um, yourself, you have, you have um, outlined very, very well in your um, initial introduction uh, what the sector is about and uh, what the uh, what the big challenges are. And uh, this is uh, something the European Commission feels very, very strongly about. Um, we are heading for climate neutrality by 2050, and um, our means to, to reach that um, is what we have called the Green Deal, which is, um, as, as you have uh, all heard, um, sort of the overarching um, approach uh, towards um, a climate neutral um, situation um, in what is now not so far, uh, not so a distant future, actually. And um, one of the elements, and here I think we really converge um, uh, to, to reach that, is to, um, to create uh, more sustainability and uh, more circularity in uh, what we produce in Europe. And the textile and footwear sector is, um, is a prime example of uh, where of an area where a lot had to be done and an area where a lot is being done and uh, what we are discussing here today is indeed um, a, a prime example of what can happen if um, public authorities and the private sector team up in order to create something um, concrete uh, something that is usable and um, that helps implement the uh, entire legislative arsenal uh, that we have. This legislative arsenal is, is, is wide, and um, as, as um, rightly been mentioned, uh, we, um, it's true that we have often been criticized for it. At the same time, it's one of the rare areas where we actually are asked by industry very often to regulate in order to create a, a level playing field. So. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's rather an unusual thing to hear uh, that people like us to regulate more. So uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to be part of that uh, sort of discussion. Um, the main elements that we have regulated uh, pertain to, uh, to human rights, to uh, due diligence in the uh, environmental and, and social area. Um, other, uh, other examples that are, that are up and coming are um, the revision of the Waste Framework Directive, uh, where extended um, producer responsibility will lead, uh, according to our analysis, to um, increased um, circularity. The uh, revision of the um, labeling uh, regulation is, is, is something that the consumer is expecting from us to know 
what's uh, in the product um, uh, that they buy. And um, all this uh, creates indeed um, the conditions uh, for more circularity, for more sustainability, but um, constitutes at the same time also a challenge. And we are very well aware of that. And um, the, the, the uh, expression of accompanying measures is something which is very easily used um, and uh, may or may not uh, trickle down to uh, ground realities. In this case here, it really does trickle down because an initiative that we started with UNECE and ITC back in 2019 already is exactly about that. And that's very much what we are discussing and celebrating here today, actually. Um, the UNEC uh, contribution to accompanying measures uh, through extremely practical tools, through policy recommendations that are, um, that are easy and clear to enact, um, all this leading to uh, increased buy-in from the private sector and uh, w while putting traceability um, at the center of it, is, um, is something we are really proud of. And um, it's, it's, it's one of these things we, uh, um, my, my colleagues and I really, really love to use as an example when, when, when we are asked, okay, can you, give, can you tell us what actually you have been doing? Um, we um, very often pull out that example of saying, listen, here is something that can really work. We have been sitting together, uh, between several regulators, together with the industry, have listened to the industry, have explained to the industry what is important for the regulator, and together have come up with something that is really practical and, um, and, and, and very useful for, for the stakeholders. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to, um, to, to, to be part of, um, of, of, of this meeting here where we, where we can stress um, um, the, the, the quality um, of the work. Uh, all the more uh, so as um, this uh, project uh, I mentioned is now going to uh, into a second phase uh, within enhanced, still enhanced um, downstream traceability and circularity. And um, I'm sure that, um, as it was mentioned, um, in, in, uh, as you're very nicely made, by the way, trailer I mentioned, uh, we're only at the beginning. So uh, very much looking forward to uh, a continued uh, great cooperation. And uh, uh, please let me extend uh, very warm thanks to our partners from UNEC for what is not only efficient, but also uh, um, a very, very uh, practical and, and uh, very pleasant uh, cooperation um, that in our view yields very good results. So thank you very much for that and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Karsten. Thank you to Karsten uh, Sorensen, uh, uh, Directorate General for International Partnerships, for your support, uh, for your uh, uh, warm wor uh, words about our partnership and the importance of the work we are carrying on and uh, the role that actually uh, what we have achieved uh, as part of this initiative is playing in support of the policy and regulatory agenda uh, at the European Union for advancing sustainability and circularity in an, in, in an industry that is very, very important for this region. Thank you very much and very much looking forward to engage further for the second phase of this initiative starting this year. Thank you, Karsten. And now, to close our institutional panel, I'm very pleased of having with us Carlo Capasa, Chairman, Camera Nazionale della Moda Italiana, a world leading force amongst fashion association for the sustainability agenda of this industry. Thank you, Carlo, for being with us today. Floor is yours. Thank you to you, thank you to everyone, and good morning. Uh, I want to say thanks to Tatiana Molchan, uh, the Executive Secretary of uh, UNEC, and Paolo Naldini, Director of Fondazione Pistoletto, for inviting me today. Thank you. Um, I, I love, as you know, just talking about sustainability, because it's one of our pillars uh, at the Italian Fashion Chamber. 
as uh, uh, we know, Italy has a huge responsibility because it is uh, the world's leading producer of luxury goods for fashion. Uh, besides everything, fashion in Italy is the second industry. Uh, more than uh, 100 billion euro production last year uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, net uh, uh, um, cost uh, of production. So it means it goes in the market for uh, 700 billion of euros in the world. Um, you have to think also that we have uh, 62,000 companies and we employ more than almost 600,000 people in production plus the same numbers in uh, uh, retail and offices. So this is why we have a real huge responsibility. We have both the downstream and the upstream, uh, the brands and the supply chain, which is something unique and extraordinary. And uh, mm, that's why we, we, we started as first uh, 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 among the other fashion chambers in uh, 2011, creating a working group uh, uh, made of managers from our members' company, such as uh, Gucci, Armani, Prada, Valentino. We represent uh, all the famous brands, but also many small brands. Uh, we, we say that we represent all creative fashion in Italy. Uh, and uh, the, I think the, the extraordinary action we succeed uh, in wo it was uh, to have all the companies join the discussion to find a common path towards sustainability. Sustainability, uh, as Tatiana, Tatiana and Carson they said before, is something we do all together or we don't do. You cannot be alone in that. And we are very happy in Italy to have all the chain, production chain. Here I see Ercole Bottopoala, who is a CEO of an incredible brand of fa fabrics, uh, Reda, that is a pioneer in sustainability. But uh, uh, without this uh, uh, union between uh, uh, the fabric makers, the producer, the brands, uh, and all that, nothing works. We have to be all together. Uh, uh, the first outcome of uh, our work was uh, our sustainability manifesto, which we launched in 2012 with a uh, massive flash mob in Milan with Michelangelo Pistoletto Foundation and more than and uh, then 1,000 people in the beautiful Piazza Duomo uh, uh, um, making a live representation of the third paradise of Michelangelo. It was really breathtaking to see all this uh, happening there. And was a strong uh, uh, movement that started uh, in that moment. Uh, there, we start the sustainability era uh, for the luxury fashion, I think. Um, but uh, 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 I'm here today for endorsing and recognizing the importance of the Sustainability Pledge, a project for sun sustainable and circular garment and footwear. I can say that today our main challenge is indeed the circular economy. As uh, uh, we, as Italian Fashion Chamber, we have partnered uh, and we still partner with uh, the L. MacArthur Foundation, uh, the leading body on this, for a working group on circular economy. Uh, the first outcome of our commitment has been the consortium Recrea. We founded together with several brands uh, under the uh, guidance of CNMI, and we created a task force to manage the difficult issue of the end of life of fashion products. Is uh, I think is a beautiful uh, initiative because we really control all life of our product uh, from the beginning uh, to the end, and uh, uh, this is a, a strong start for Italian fashion. Always uh, uh, on a circular economy, we are lobbying at uh, uh, an European level, thanks to our rule in the European Fashion Association, IFA, on several topics related to sustainability, for example, the digital product passport and uh, eco-design. We are also part of the technical secretariat of the working group PEF, Pro, uh, that is the product environmental footprint at the European Commission. So we are very active. We are also working on an extraordinary project with the, the uh, UN uh, uh, and our brands with the Ethical Fashion Initiative from the UN about the due diligence specifically uh, made for the fashion luxury. 
In this moment, as you know, we have many standards and it is important to have a common framework to assess the sustainability for consumers, brands and suppliers. Otherwise, nobody is able to understand when a brand is really sustainable. So having a common tool is uh, important in this moment. It's one of our main initiative. Uh, finally, uh, I will be happy to tell you more in the next months, but we are working on an internal study on durability of luxury fashion items. You know, some uh, of our member companies decide to join forces to inquire about the physical and emotional durability of product. Uh, the goal is to find a common way to give value to this feature on the luxury market that goes beyond the current debate within the European Commission. I want to give an example on this. If we just uh, uh, judge durability from a piece of fabric, and we stress a piece of fabric, probably is a, a, a piece of fabric from a soccer uh, a football t-shirt. Uh, it's, it looks very durable, but in true, it's going to be uh, uh, discharged in six months. On a, a Valentino lace dress, if you stress the fabric, it's not durable at all, but it stays in the wardrobe for three generations. So we believe that this is uh, the, what we call uh, emotional sustainability, and it means that we have to measure the sustainability on the final product, on our opinion. When, uh, how long is going to be in the market this final product? And we can use digital passport for this. D this could be a very important use of digital passport and on trashability of the product until the end of his life. So I want to just to, uh, uh, conclude uh, my speech uh, inviting you here in the afternoon session at 4.30 where we will listen to three amazing brand, uh, an interesting brand, not a big brand, but very, very uh, uh, um, linked to sustainability. Uh, and they are SEBC, Pairi Daesa and Made for a Woman. And uh, this will be moderated by Julia Braga from the World Bank. So uh, please be here to listen uh, from the live voice of, of people in charge in this uh, matter, what happen, is, uh, happen in the real life of the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, to Carlo Capaza. Thank you, Carlo, for sharing the vision and action of the um, Italian National Chamber of Fashion uh, for a circular, digital, innovative agenda for this industry, uh, and actually for underlining also the importance of a collaborative effort. No one can do this alone. Very important that the fashion industry comes together with manufacturers, institutions, solution providers. It is a collaborative effort, and this is what the community of practice of the Sustainability Pledge is about. Uh, and thank you also very much for your support in organizing a very inspiring session this afternoon with young brands, designers that have sustainability in their DNA, which is very important. It's right at the start of their enterprise. Thank you for that. So um, to conclude our uh, opening session, many thanks again to UNEC, the European Commission, Camera Nazionale della Moda, il Ministero um, dell'Ambiente e la sic uh, Sicurezza Energetica. And now let us start our event. This one day event will be really... This one-day event will be the opportunity to discuss the key findings and lessons learned of the Sustainability Pledge Initiative launched back in 2021. This includes key performance indicators because we need to measure progress. We need to measure traceability and transparency levels all along the value chain. Uh, we need to measure uh, and to identify what are the best practices under the community of practice, um, innovative solutions that can foster impact and, uh, and uh, common endeavors for sustainable and circular um, uh, value chains in uh, the industry of the future. So I would, uh, I would like now to invite on stage uh, the panelists for our first panel discussion, please.
Perfect. So, mm -hmm. for our uh, first panel discussion, this is going to be dedicated to the community of practice of the Sustainability Pledge. It's a community of practice that we are launching here today with the video that is jointly produced with the Città dell'Arte Fondazione Pistoletto for this three years anniversary of the Sustainability Pledge. So, we can launch the video. Thank you. They protect us. They cover us. They make part of us and who we are. They are part of the story of our lives every single day, every single night. They are gifts, they are heritage, they are culture. We buy them, we share them. Clothes trace our lives. At the UNACE, we trace our clothes. Few years ago, United Nations member states gave us a challenge. Prove traceability and transparency are possible in the garment and footwear sector. Today, we are tracing cotton, leather, synthetic, man-made cellulosic wool products all over the world. From production to use, we look to feed global common knowledge for this industry. Risks and opportunities, policy recommendations, improve trusted and verified standards. The textile sector has strong environmental and social impacts today and feeds millions of families around the world. From the UNECE, we want our joint experiences to become the basis for regulations and practices. Preparing today, the garment and footwear sector of the future. Since 2021, the Sustainability Pledge has succeeded in becoming the reference network to advance globally towards a more traceable, transparent, circular and sustainable garment and footwear sector. Today, our initiative is the framework where key actors join forces. They come from the academia, civil society, international organizations, suppliers, producers, and retailers. We count high diversity of pledging companies, from micro enterprises, through small, medium, to large companies, pledging for traceability and transparency actions. They join from Europe, America, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. Clearer than ever, it is crucial to create a strong community of practice to accelerate traceability and transparency initiatives and share best practices in the garment and footwear industry. Over 100 pledges received in only three years. More on the way. This is just the beginning a promising start. The Sustainability Pledge continues its calls to action. Excellent, thank you. These are the members of the Sustainability Pledge community of practice, all those that have joined so far more uh, to join, of course, as our community of practice and sustainability pledge initiative is going to continue. And now we have on stage representatives of the sustainability pledge members, actors, so of institutions, business associations, businesses, civil society, academia, and solution providers. These are the actors that have joined the Sustainability Pledge and formed the community uh, uh, of practice, which is a growing community. Now, uh, the main purpose of this community of practice, let me briefly recall that, is first of all to share about progress and lessons learned from implementation of the actions that have been submitted, so the actions that pledgers have been taking to advance traceability and transparency all along value chains. 
second purpose is to measure such progress against key performance indicators uh, that have been developed actually um, from the actions already submitted. And we will see more in detail what these key performance indicators are to measure uh, progress. And finally, is really to contribute to the further dissemination of the uh, call to action. Now today, the community of practice of the sustainability pledge is convened for the very first time and will continue convening and contributing to production of regular reports where we are going to tell basically what it has been achieved, what is the progress, what have, are also the challenges in doing traceability and transparency uh, along uh, all value chains and what are the next steps. So the first report is going to be presented today and we are going to regularly produce it under the initiative. And, but now let's uh, discuss with the panelists on stage uh, the need for such community of practice. Why do we need such a community of practice? Uh, and we have some key stakeholders. We have a representative of civil society, uh, so Paul Roland, uh, which is the transparency lead uh, at Clean Clothes Campaign with us today. Welcome, Paul. And we have Francesca Romana uh, Rinaldi, that is a UNEC project expert and director of the Monitor for Circular Fashion, as the uh, Bocconi, a representative of academia, but also uh, of an initiative that brings together uh, business actors, uh, brands, retailers, manufacturers, raw material producers, so a very important initiative. And then... <clears throat> Thank you very much, Francesca, for joining. And then we have from Uzbekistan, uh, Mirk Muntzin uh, Sultanov, that is the acting chairman of the Uzbek Textile and Garment Industry Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. And connected uh, online, uh, we have a uh, representative of UNIDO, uh, the United Nations Industrial uh, Development Organization, Mark Draek, that is Chief Technical Advisor at UNIDO. Mark, thank you so much for joining us online. So, starting with Paul, uh, from the Clean Clothes campaign, Paul, why do you believe a community of practice around traceability and transparency in this industry is so needed? The point of view of a civil society organization. What is the action that the Clean Clothes Campaign has submitted for the Sustainability Pledge, actually one of the first actions back in 2021, and what have you achieved over the last three years? Over to you, Paul. Yes, uh, it shall come as no surprise that I will start with a little uh, raining on the parade um, and to uh, see why traceability and transparency is so needed. Uh, I want to call into memory uh, a juridical action from last week here in Italy where uh, a supplier for a well-known luxury brand um, was actually placed under curatorship because um, people were exploited in the factories right here. And it wasn't the first time. Uh, this time it was Dior, but it was Armani earlier this year. And these were not very long and complex supply chains. These were not going to countries where it's hard to do monitoring. You could basically get on a bicycle from here and check these places. So that is why uh, traceability and transparency is so important because we want to be able to uh, discover these kinds of issues, these kinds of uh, rights abuses earlier. Um, and why do we want to discover them? Well, the most important thing is because the workers have a right to remedy. Uh, the right of remedy is one of the three pillars of the UN guiding principles, and it's a cornerstone of the uh, OECD guidance. Um, as you may have, uh, as you may hear, both of these were 
guidances, but we have moved beyond guidance now with the um, introduction of the uh, CSDD uh, and other supply chain laws. These guiding principles are no lo longer principles. They are no longer soft law. They are being turned into hard law. To me, it also shows that par partial transparency does not work. Partial transparency is when there's, for instance, an agreement with um, a single gatekeeper that gets access to a limited set of the information. For instance, uh, a global uh, agreement between a brand and a global union. Why is that problematic? Because the most vulnerable of workers are often the ones that are not able to unionize. They, uh, maybe it's because of their immigration status. It can be because they're home-based workers or working in the informal sector or in countries where FOA is not a given. Freedom of association, sorry for the jargon. Um, the, in many countries, freedom of association is not a given. Plus, we are, uh, need to look at the supply chain more holistically because the union may not be the right place to look at environmental risks. That is not their expertise. That is not what they are qualified. That's not what they're looking for. So we need full accountability, and for that we need full transparency and traceability right to the raw materials. And when I say raw materials, I also mean recycled materials and the places where they're recycled. And the access should be for all, for academia, for journalists, for lawmakers, law enforcers, civil society, suppliers, but even also for business. If you want to restore trust with your consumers that your product is actually worth um, their money, you will have to convince them that it's made sustainable. So business does have an interest in becoming traceable and transparent. And of course, most importantly, the workers and affected communities need it to become empowered stakeholders. They are now often seen as victims. They should not be. They are stakeholders. They, sh they have a voice. And to get their accountability, they need traceability and transparency. To get back to our action, it's called Fashion Checker. Uh, it fo focuses on location transparency and wages. We picked wages, well, because wages are vital. They are also a proxy of many associated problems like excessive overtime. And what Fashion Checker does is a, a reality check on policies. The policies that the brand has and the reality on the ground, what does a worker get at the end of the month? Um, we started in April 2020, which in hindsight, wasn't the best planning to do a lot of field research, as you may remember. Uh, there was a light pandemic going on. Um, so there were lots of challenges, but together working with Wage Indicator Foundation and Fashion Revolution uh, and our many partners on the ground, uh, trade unions, we are now able to um, collect lots of pay slips, to get lots of payment data, to see what the policies towards a living wage are actually worth. The news is not very positive, I have to say. We have to uh, do better, but we want to have that reality check. And over time, that information should be much easier to get. Um, groups like the FLA have uh, done excellent work in standardizing methodologies, uh, and also more and more workers are paid uh, electronically these days, which means the data is actually available. They are there. They're just not transparent and accessible and we need to change that. We also need to, have, uh, uh, to make sure that there are standards that this kind of data becomes machine readable uh, because civil society does not have the people power to um, process this amount of data if it's not machine readable. Other place, we have to employ unpaid labor, we call them interns, uh, that's not a scalable solution. If we want to scale up traceability and transparency, machine readability is key to data standards, and that's where the work of the UNECE comes in very, very, very handy. So for the future of Fashion Checker, uh, our plans are to include information per facility, so per factory, on the remedy mechanisms that are available to workers. The remedy mechanisms can depend on which MSI uh, member brands produce in a factory uh, or which uh, supply chain uh, laws uh, brands fall under that produce there. So the idea is to help workers get their right to remedy uh, on, uh, by, so that they can check that on uh, Fashion Checker and achieve that right to remedy. 
uh, because the right to remedy asset, it's a right. It's not a nice to have. Um, and we, yeah, we want to focus on impact rather than on policy. To be very blunt, you can't feed your children with a policy. <laughs> so uh, I also want to draw some uh, attention to the excellent proposal from Cornell University, from Professor Saras Kurovilla and Jason Jad, who just published um, a very concrete plan to have metrics for uh, supply chain uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, very 25 very concrete metrics. Um, it's called labor outcomes metrics. I really hope you all read it because it's very helpful. Um, so we want to unlock more than just location data. We've made great progress in location data with initiatives like the Open Supply Hub, which traces over 300,000 locations already. But we also will need social and environmental data to get, create a true community of practice. And I challenge every one of you to step up the effort because the planet and the people cannot wait any longer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for sharing about uh, your action, the fashion checker, and its focus on a very important aspect, increasing living wages. There are workers and people behind the clothes we wear. And thank you very much to Clean Clothes Campaign for being part of this community of practice. Civil society plays a very important role and for being a member of this community of practice since the very, very beginning. And now, turning the floor to Francesca, Francesca Romana Rinaldi, Director of the Monitor for Circular Fashion at Sta uh, Bocconi. Uh, now, same question for you, uh, Francesca. If you can please share the point of view of academia, but also businesses, brands, manufacturers that are part of your monitor for circular fashion. Why the community of practice is important. What is the action that you have submitted, what you have achieved so far? Great. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned, um, the Monitor for Circular Fashion is a scientific and technological community. It is also a research observatory in uh, SDA Bocconi. And we include, as you can see here, players upstream in the value chain and downstream in the value chain, but also service providers. Uh, and also um, the research technical partners, including uh, uh, organizations that enable the Monitor to be more and more European, I would say and international overall. So why a community of practice is, need is needed and also why uh, we decided as Monitor for Circular Fashion to participate to a pledge and to submit our pledge since the beginning. Uh, well, we believe it's important to create the level playing fields and in order to do that, uh, it's also important to have more and more players that commit and also implement traceability and transparency in garment, garment and footwear uh, value chains. Uh, there is also a second reason, which is connected to that, uh, which is fighting greenwashing. Um, and the third, I will say, is uh, giving visibility to best practices. And this is also what we are trying to do in the Monitor for Circular Fashion, but we do it in a concrete way, so it's not just uh, presenting uh, what brands have been doing and other players have been doing, but to work with them, and uh, we do it also following the steps of UNEC, I would say, implementing the methodology that UNEC has shared, the toolkit, um, and we do it with the uh, projects. Uh, not all of them are just pilot projects. We also try to work on industrialized projects because we believe that this is the way to go. As we mentioned already, scale up, scaling up, it's important. And we do it by implementing uh, KPIs. Um, so what we have been presenting as a pledge and what is our contribution also uh, to this community of practice that is um, uh, convening for the first time today, but uh, we know for sure that it's going to grow and grow more and more uh, as more pledges will come. Um, well, first of all, what we would like to do is to contribute to identifying KPIs, traceability and transparency KPIs and circularity KPIs collaborating with our universities as well. So we'll consider all the publications, including uh, what Paul has mentioned now. Um, and we do it on a yearly basis. And uh, we test these KPIs also with the projects, these implementations 
um, are important in order to fine tune also the KPIs. Of course, the publication uh, that Maria Teresa has mentioned, the UNEC publication, will be a very important tool for us. So we'll be testing also uh, some of these, these KPIs, um, again, through projects. Um, and we also um, would like to continue working um, with companies uh, on identifying uh, well-done sustainability claims, uh, both B2B, B2C, also B2B2C, B2 sustainability claims that are supported by data, by concrete data that are substantiated, uh, as we are asked to do also uh, by the European Commission. Um, so this is the way to go. Um, and uh, I would say the last... Uh, uh, important element um, among the many in the pledge is the fact that we would like to create an even stronger community in time uh, in order to share results, share results transparently to everyone, to the whole industry. And we do it every year on a yearly basis, also with an event. You're all invited also to the next monitor event uh, in February 2025. Um, uh, one last uh, um, point uh, to say that the evolution has been, um, I believe, um, a good evolution in the last um, uh, years. And uh, basically, we created the community in 2021, um, and now is the fourth year. Uh, we increased the number of companies that are now in total with the partners uh, of the research techni technical partners at 31, and we are willing to grow as well. Uh, involving more and more players, even SMEs, and we do it through the C Factor initiative. Uh, we're also willing to um, be even more transparent in the future, involve uh, also um, a, a bigger number of players, even if they're not uh, partners with uh, other kind of collaborations. Uh, and we also submitted another pledge, which is definitely very consistent with the UNEC pledge uh, to the textile transition pathway um, uh, European Commission, um, and this has been done on uh, eight actions out of the uh, 50 in total, and of course one was on traceability and transparency. So we'll continue further. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thank you for sharing the good progress at the Monitor for Circular Fashion. Very pleased to hear that our work at UNEC has been an inspiration was for special, your work <laughs> at uh, Zdabokoni. Um, excellent. And now I would like uh, to uh, turn the floor to um, actually Mr. Sultanov, that is leading the Uzbek Textile and Garment Industry Association. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Uzbekistan, Tashkent, uh, to uh, Milano, and for sharing with us the point of view of a business association in a transition economy in a country that is a leading country when it comes to raw material uh, supply uh, for this industry, but that is moving up the ladder and actually industrializing also textile and clothing uh, production. So, your point of view, uh, importance of having a collaborative approach, community of practice, what is the progress for the pledge that uh, uh, Uzbek uh, Textile um, Association uh, has been uh, submitting now two years ago, and where do you stand? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting us uh, and uh, to participate in this great event in this forum. Uh, so, uh, coming back to your question, Uzbekistan could be a great uh, example for uh, why traceability and uh, transparency is important. Because for a uh, long time, Uzbekistan as a cotton growing country uh, was under so-called cotton campaigns by cotton. So, uh, because of uh, tremendous uh, reforms made in industry, uh, and uh, for, to name uh, the privatization of whole industry, uh, cotton industry, and uh, acknowledgement ratification of all international uh, laws and uh, uh, international requirements, and uh, being starting to uh, open the, to the world, uh, engaging the NGOs into the industry. So. Uh, after 13 years, Uzbekistan has uh, got out of uh, boycott. So it happened two years ago, exactly uh, when Uzbekistan has uh, started 
to join a sustainability pledge also. So uh, what Uzbekistan did? Uzbekistan has uh, made its, uh, its new model into the uh, cotton industry to make it more traceable, to make it more uh, traceable and transparent. So now uh, if uh, cotton industry in past was uh, fully regulated by government and that's why uh, there was some issues with forced and child labors, right now it is fully privatized and it is one of uh, highly earning, uh, earned uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. Uh, to name that uh, in uh, September, October, in harvest season, people often go out of factories, go out from uh, offices to pick cotton because it's paid more. Uh, uh, if to uh, give example, uh, in uh, three, 13 years time, we used to pay for cotton pickers 10 times lesser than now they are getting. So. It is including inflation and everything, 10 times more. So uh, it is right now more uh, beneficial and uh, it is private. So right now, the Uzbekistan has cluster regime in cotton sector. This cluster regime has uh, all the vertical integrated production, starting from cotton sector and uh, to uh, uh, ginning, uh, yarn uh, spinning, uh, fabric and ready-made garment under one roof. So Uzbekistan is a great place to trace whole production line in 100 kilometers square. Uh, so uh, this is a good example and uh, this results, uh, it is, you know, uh, it is not just a small uh, place. Uh, Uzbekistan's uh, almost uh, more than half part of agricultural land was uh, for cotton. So we have achieved to prioritize whole more than a million hectares of uh, cut, uh, agriculture. Coming uh, as those reforms have been made, cotton campaign and the International Labor Organization has acknowledged the reforms and uh, results, but we, we didn't uh, stay in this position. So we start to uh, uh, communicate and uh, collaborate with international uh, organizations. So uh, right now we are uh, having uh, really good support from uh, donor community, international uh, organizations, uh, to name international labor organization. So uh, we had uh, joined the pledge, uh, sustainability pledge, and then uh, uh, with the help of uh, UNEC, we've done a pilot project uh, to trace whole uh, vertical production line. So in that corner, we have a sample of our uh, product. Uh, so I would uh, encourage everyone to uh, get uh, to know it. So, uh, so this is great result for, for us. And beside that, uh, now uh, with the help of UNEC and other international organizations, we have started project with uh, a Better Cotton Initiative and Better Work. Uh, so uh, right now we are having more and more uh, certified by those two uh, programs, uh, clusters, producers. So, but you know, uh, today's topic is scaling the transparency. Of course, uh, as Paul told, uh, there should be more from the production side to get involved. But it comes from the market side also, as uh, it will be more acknowledged, as it will be more required. I think, uh, and, uh, and when the producers have this, uh, requ uh, producers meet this requirement, if it is uh, motivated, by uh, market, uh, so I think it will be uh, more uh, scaled and uh, it will be more continuous, I think. Because right now we have great uh, pilot project and uh, it cannot survive, it cannot continue if it's not uh, 
uh, demanded in the market. So demand yeah. is uh, moving force in this space. Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, glad to be here with you today and uh, I'm uh, very honored to invite you to uh, visit Uzbekistan. So Uzbekistan is a great place and there is a great occasion to visit Uzbekistan. So this uh, September at, we have an uh, annual conference, joint conference of uh, International Textile Manufacturers Federation and International Apparel Federation uh, that will be in Samarkand. Uh, it is really beautiful city to visit. So I hope uh, to see you in Uzbekistan in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Sultanov for sharing about uh, the journey that Uzbekistan has undertaken and the success story that Uzbekistan uh, is uh, thanks to the engagement uh, with the international community, uh, but also a collaborative effort throughout the country with the industry uh, to meet the demands for traceability, sustainability, uh, which is uh, uh, really underpinning, uh, importantly, the industrial development, uh, sustainable industrial development uh, in the country. And of course, I uh, also joined that invitation, go to Uzbekistan, it's an amazing country uh, to, to visit and it will be super interesting actually to attend uh, your conference. As UNEC, we plan to be there actually. And now turning to uh, our last speaker for this first uh, uh, panel connected online. Uh, it's Mark Dreieck, Chief Technical Advisor at the UN Industrial Development Organization. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining online and questions to you, the point of view of an international organization why collaborative efforts, community of practice is important. Uh, UNIDO is also a pledger to the sustainability pledge with the switch to circular initiative. What is the initiative about? What is the progress so far? Uh, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Maria Teresa, and um, good morning to my colleagues in the panel and, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you from Vienna, UNIDO headquarters. I apologize for not being able to be there uh, in person, but indeed I would like to use the Switch to Circular Economy Value Chains project uh, as, an, as an example to, to, make, um, to make the discussion concrete and also use that then as a way to answer your question. So what is this project? It's funded by, by the EU, by DG INPA and co-financed by, by Finland. We are over half of the implementation period, so indeed results are, are coming in. Uh, and the overarching aim of the project is indeed to, 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 to push for, for circular business models in, in three target value chains. Uh, textile is, of course, the one that we will talk about today. Um, and we have, UNIDO is leading this, this, this initiative, and we have three strategic partners, knowledge uh, partners in Chatham House, Circle, Circle Economy Foundation and EIB to cover a respective area, um, policy in the case of Chatham House, capacity building in, for the private sector to address needs there uh, in the case of Circle Economy. And then of course also uh, when it comes to capacity of financing institutions and, and the actual investments uh, to, to, to pay for the shift to more circular, circularity, that is where the EIB comes in. But what is um, a bit um, special, I would say, about this project is then how do we want to make sure that uh, what words that have also been mentioned, like this holistic approach, this uh, making sure that uh, whatever we try is going to make sense from the different stakeholders, uh, which is so important, especially for a complicated and fragmented value chain like textile. And, and what we did there is uh, establish uh, partnerships with leading brands to jointly design uh, industrial innovative pilots uh, to, to, to see how we can advance um, uh, in, 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 in a very concrete setting. And these results should then feed, of course, into 
uh, what uh, are the necessary changes at policy level, uh, capacity financing, um, and so on. And that is what I would like to talk a bit more about. What are these pilots and what are what is coming out of that? So we have essentially um, uh, a partnership with, with two brands. Uh, one is with bestseller um, Danish brand and with H&M uh, Swedish brand. And, and overall, we want to, uh, and, and, and the target country that, uh, that uh, we are focusing on is Bangladesh. Um, not surprisingly, uh, I imagine as being a major, a major manufacturing country. And, and the, the, the push that is, of course, there from the upcoming European uh, legislation um, is, is much welcomed, is, is taken uh, very seriously also by brands, by at least certain parts of, of the industry locally as well. But what we want to then see is how, how does that then work to, to comply with, uh, with that push and what are the challenges then on the ground? Uh, and, and I use the word comply and compliance because that is, of course, a part of, of the whole story. But what we also want to want to advocate for is to the industry uh, locally, like use this as an opportunity, as a business opportunity, because if you play it right, this is, um, this is of, of business interest. Um, and, and then, of course, the environmental benefits and the, and the compliance with, um, with, 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 with social dimensions um, are also there. But this is also the, this is the story that we want to bring. Um, and this resonates uh, well generally, but of course there are challenges. And um, the challenges are, are, related, are, are there, are identified at several levels. Uh, and traceability, I will come to that then also because it's it's cross-cutting in a in a sense. But what we see, of course, as challenges is simply the the access to the waste. Um, because until recently, there was very little interest in this in this waste. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, nothing is happening. There is a parallel economy. There is informal sector. There there are many. Uh, there is export. Um, there is global trade. So uh, many things are happening. So having getting that access to the waste is already uh, an area um, uh, of, of attention. And then even when you then get access to the waste, then um, technical questions come come in in terms of uh, fiber length, in terms of quality. To what extent can this be recycled uh, into into garments? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, even if these, um, these elements in these boxes are ticked, then what about volumes? Can, we, can, can, uh, can the necessary volumes be, be secured? And then, of course, also the, the whole price uh, um, uh, element of, of making it, making it profit, profitable and how can margins be, be there for everyone? And, and, and traceability, of course, is, is also there in, in this whole story, because um, the waste, um, and, and once again, this has very, has received uh, limited attention until now. Um, so we, we are trying to help in that. And you can see on the slide, we have a number of partners to help us with that. One of our technical partners in the bestseller pilot is Reverse Resources. They, they, they try to indeed uh, bring both the suppliers of the waste, so the, uh, because we're talking about post-industrial um, textile waste. Sorry, I did not maybe clarify that. That is the, the current um, uh, focus of our attention. So the suppliers of that waste uh, to enter on a platform and then um, the demand for that waste from recyclers, from other actors uh, can be matched. And of course, uh, this is then facilitating the whole uh, the whole um, value chain for recycled products, but of course that also enables them to get access to data, data that we will need for traceability, for accountability, for uh, the digital product passport. So that is what we're trying to do there. And we have a GFA, Global Fashion Agenda, for the connection with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with global brands, and then BGMEA, which is the industry association in Bangladesh, to also keep that connection with the sector as a whole. Um, I'd like to say just a few words also on the H&M pilot uh, on similar lines, but there we want to tackle the, the bestseller pilot is mostly on cotton. Cotton is relatively relatively uh, simple in a way, but then when it comes to blended waste, then of course you enter into a whole new 
technology challenge and, and, and in the in the pilot with HM we want to to pilot certain advanced recycling technologies to also tackle the the, the polycotton the polycotton blends. Um, all of that to say um, very exciting. Of course I'm I'm not objective maybe but I find this all very exciting and we expect more and more results to to come in and then also see to what extent the story that we are trying to bring, like this is a business opportunity uh, and um, this, uh, if you play it right with uh, with full compliance, then um, then uh, then uh, it would be a missed opportunity not to do it. But we want to see uh, to what extent and at what pace and at what scale this can actually happen in a country like Bangladesh, because if it can happen in Bangladesh, then we can also look at other countries. We are actually currently looking or a, a complementary pilot in, in Egypt, uh, if mm. there are brands out there with, um, with, with activities in Egypt, uh, do not hesitate to reach out. We would like to hear your views on to what extent this could be, be relevant. And now, finally, uh, also mindful of the time, um, coming back to your questions also, Maria Teresa, I, what I try to demonstrate with this is that such a community of, of practice where, where different results, different learnings, failures, as well as successes can be shared is, is very much needed, once again, because of the, of the complexity of a, of a value chain like textile and, and the global nature of it. So, so we, are, we remain, um, as, a, as a UN agency, fully committed to that. Our pledge is about uh, inclusive and sustainable industrial development for the textile value chain. And I have, I have used this example of this project now to try and hopefully make it uh, a bit concrete. Uh, and also because this is the project that I know best, but for your information, we have uh, the division that I work in circular economy and green industry, we have over 30 other projects, um, not always on, on textile. We also work on value chains, on other value chains, where, by the way, some of the traceability challenges that the, that the things that we learned there, like in plastic, could also be relevant for learnings in textile. Uh, and I'll finish uh, in in a, in a second. But we also have other work, like better cotton was man, uh, was mentioned uh, in Africa, um, um, in 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 Egypt, um, and other countries. So we are um, we continue to. Uh, to, to be committed to, to sharing those experience and experiences and making sure that we can accelerate the shift to circularity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for joining online and thank you for sharing about uh, Switch to Circular and the focus of your initiative on the post-consumption. This is something that uh, we are going to address more in depth in the afternoon with the Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation. So thank you for joining and thank you for the holistic approach that you are taking to advancing circularity in the industry with the focus on the global south and countries that are more at the upstream part of the value chain. So, uh, many thanks to all panelists for joining this uh, first panel uh, of the day. Uh, thank you for inspiring other industry actors to take action and walk the talk. And now let me uh, give the floor uh, for uh, an inspiring uh, conversation uh, that uh, will follow. Paolo Naldini, director of Fondazione Pistoletto Città dell'Arte. Thank you, Paolo. And Marco San Micheli, design, fashion, and crafts curator at Triennale Milano and director of the Italian Museum of Design. Uh, they will have now a conversation. And thank you very much again, Marco, for hosting us in this amazing place. Over to you. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa. Good morning, everybody. Now I understand we are, the, Marco, the, the only obstacle between uh, you participants and the coffee break. So it is going to be an uncomfortable, I hope, uh, um, uh, rapid uh, situation. And I would like then to kind of wrap up uh, and prepare for the next uh, panels uh, during the day that will provide us with a lot of uh, not only insights, but with uh, hard facts 
Um, so we, uh, we have already seen quite uh, a lot of uh, facts and cases being mentioned this morning. But let me go, uh, with Marco, uh, introducing also a conversation we might have uh, together for a few minutes. Let me go to the title of this uh, event. We uh, um, combined uh, uh, an effort of uh, creativity between our team in Città dell'Arte and uh, the UNAC team. So we came up with these uh, uh, main topics of uh, vision, visibility, transparency, and scaling up. As all of them have been already mentioned in the morning. But uh, what I think we need to, uh, or I would like to uh, grab from that is something that puts them together, which is the future. Why do I say that future is what brings together vision, visibility, and transparency, if not even scaling up? It's uh, because uh, if you don't see it, if you can't imagine it, you won't make it. You will not achieve it. Uh, it it's hard, trivial fact of life. But how can you see it if it does not appear, if you can't not see traces of any phenomenon? If you don't see traces of a phenomenon, how can you, how can you see it? So traceability is paramount, is fundamental for going into the future. And uh, why would you not be able to see traces? Maybe because there is no transparency. It's simply too opaque. And we know there are many reasons to be kept in opacity. Because maybe there are hidden things. Traces maybe could be there, but they're just hidden. And Paul has given us some examples about that this morning. You know? and, uh, but there's another element why perhaps we would not see traces. It's because they are not there, because yet the phenomenon is not there. We're talking of something that is not yet existing. Wow, so this is extra exciting now. We're talking about seeing what, is, what does not exist, seeing the future, well, uh, this is something that, of course, oftentimes has been associated with the capacity of artists to step in and see in the invisible. But let me say it's not just an artistic endeavor here at all. Uh, it's been said uh, by Carlo this morning that uh, if we don't come together, we will not make it. Talking about sustainability, talking about the future which we are here to make. So if you don't see it because yet it does not exist, you can still make it. Make the future you want to see. And so now we are moving from viewing to envisioning, to have a vision. So this is something that um, I think has already happened in the past, and art was involved in that. Not far from here, it was in Florence quite a long time ago but not that far that we, can't re for, uh, we shouldn't remember that. And I would like to point just a, a, a single artwork. It's the universal judgment, il giudizio universale. Well, now it's the, the universal judgment has come. <laughs> here, we, here it is. It's time for us to judge and be judged upon our own survival. And now that is the artwork that we need to do together. It's not anymore to represent the vision of uh, the church. It's time to represent our future in order to make it. And so that's why I feel very comfortable to be sitting along with uh, the industries, with the National Chamber of Fashion, with the politicians, with the administrators, and of course with the artists. And that's why I'm so glad to be here in Triennale, where all this is happening. Thank you very much, Paolo. I mean, indulging in the biblical metaphoric metaphor, I mean, the angel of the apocalypse in the last uh, book of the Bible is actually 
pointing the finger against humanity. So it's nothing about God. I mean, if they are, you know, facing the apocalypse, it's because of the bad behaviors of the humanity. But um, let me convey, first of all, the greeting and the uh, support of President Stefano Boeri and Director General Carla Morogallo, because if uh, this uh, conference is taking place here at the Triennale, it's because we truly believe the joining forces is fundamental. And what a, cultural, a public cultural institution can do is offering the platform to make visible things that usually they don't have enough or stronger voice to reach a, a bigger audience. Um, when this morning I was in front of my closet and deciding what to wear, I immediately picked these shoes because I keep repairing my shoes because these are very old, these are very boring Stan Smith Adidas, but I said like, I also want to uh, in somehow wear something that is um, witnessing my single behavior, because I think among the transparency and the vision of the future, there's the single behavior that every one of us can, can offer and can practice. Coming to the museum I run, the design museum which is downstairs, and I hope you will have time to visit, uh, every object has a caption, and every caption is a sort of a passport that is testifying how was impossible, how was uh, not yet delivered or imagined then, thanks to the creativity and the major effort of a designer, of an entrepreneur, became possible. And one of a common thread, a common ground that is going through the whole collection is that objects have been able to change behaviors. Now we have we are in a situation that there's so many objects and so many things around us that we need to deal on how to, you know, um, uh, give the objects a sort of a patent and a sort of a passport to make these objects reused and reused and, 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 and part of our cultural landscape. I truly appreciate it when President Capaza quoted the fact that the Valentino dress can be there for generations and also the objects of Italian design have been there for a long time and for decades also because they've been passed from a family to another, from generation to generation. But I also would like to, because we are here talking about fashion and textile contribution, to bring an example on how sustainability in terms of textile became an, an ordinary practice here at the Triennale. At the moment downstairs we have a we have uh, an exhibition called The Imperfect Home. is a personal exhibition of Inga Sempe, the French designer, where we reproduced um, uh, an, an apartment. The different ambience, the different spaces of this apartment are made by textile walls. And we asked a Danish supplier, which was, was one of the factory that Inga Sempe worked with, Quadrat in Denmark, to supply us with these fabrics. But the company, and this was something that as a museum, as a public institution, we learned from the company, we signed a contract where we were obliged to tell how we are gonna reuse the textile, the large amount, the many meters we add from them in the near future. So it took, you know, almost one extra month with all the team of Triennale to find out how we are gonna use this because usually we, incorporate the material and we storage the material after the exhibitions, thinking and hoping that a new designer will reuse the material, but this is really rare that it happens. Actually, the Sambone exhibitions, 95% of the exhibitions design has been recycled for previous exhibitions. But going back to the textile ones from Quadrat and from Inga Sempe, in the contract we signed that two thirds of, uh, no, one third of the textile will be part of the collection. So we will keep, and keep them preserved as part of the collection because we value the design behind and the um, manufacturing behind the textile. One third is for our didactic activity. So it will be reused for the activities of the museum. And the last third will, will be reused and we already 
um, invited a designer to reuse this textile for merchandising and for external use in the Garden of Triennale. This is a little, little gesture that, we, that I can share with you, but this is something we truly think that will um, change the way we uh, interact with, 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 with suppliers. Well, thank you, Marco. I take at least a, a couple of lessons home uh, after that. First is that, uh, yes, museums, as every other organization, can be small or maybe micro governments because they make decisions. They make decisions that affect our life and people's lives. And this is exactly what is happening. And we need to become more and more aware of this in order to uh, orient our decision-making processes towards a common good, which is exactly what communities of practice are there for. Bring people together in practices, and there is a word for that that in Città dell'Arte we have uh, created some time ago that is very uh, strong for this, is to move from uh, democracy to democracy. So the practice in itself is the government. If we, if we don't get to understand that we can govern much of our life, at least as much as our represented elected governments do, we will never make it. That's also part of the community of practice and also part of uh, coming all together into this effort. Well, now I think we, we, we can go and have this uh, coffee break. I remind you, we have 40 minutes, and then I uh, invite you to stay with us the whole day. Dulcis in fundo, sweet at the uh, last moment, will be the visionary. So from viewing to visioning to visionarying this afternoon with Michelangelo Pistoletto, Gunter Pauli, and Diana Thomas. Thank you very much, very much. Uh, Paolo and Marco for an inspiring conversation. And thank you, Marco, for mentioning about your shoes because we have been tracing them, actually, <laughs> from Brazil all over to uh, Germany and uh, um, you know, consumers' markets. So, excellent. And now, coffee is served outside on the terrace. Please enjoy it. And back, please, in maximum 30 minutes because we are going to have another very interesting panel discussion led by our media partner, WWD, Luisa Zargani, about key performance indicators. Enjoy your break.